Download the free Gun Dealio app to your smartphone. Find out about the latest deals and news on guns and gear. Includes the latest Gun Talk podcast and Gun Talk videos. That's Gun Dealio on the App Store and Google Play. Gun Talk. I'm Tom Gresham, and we are in Germany. We're at the IWA Show, IWA Show in Nuremberg, Germany. It's the the shot show for Europe, if you will, or actually for the rest of the world, almost. And we're sitting in the Ruger booth. The folks here have been kind enough to host us. It's a it's a fabulous show. A lot of people think, well, they don't have a lot of guns, a lot of shooting in Europe. Well, I'm here to tell you that's not true. When you walk through this place, it's amazing. Chris Colloy has just joined us, the president, CEO of Ruger. And Chris, we were talking a little bit a minute ago. Uh, man, there's a lot of guns around here. There really are, and there's a lot of, a lot of neat displays. You see yeah. some the booths that you might find are the, certain booths that are small in uh, over here at this show, like the Ruger booth and things like that, big in the U.S. And over here, it's dominated by booths like Beretta, Umarex. And then uh, you might not even know, like Blazer. Exactly, you know, very big. Big, big European company. I think the number one selling rifle in Europe for hunting. Uh, we don't even know about that, at least not much in the U.S. You know, some things are very different as you walk around, and then some things are the same. One of the things that surprised me uh, a couple of years ago when I first came here is seeing ARs here. I did not expect to see that. There, there are some. Most of them are sold, you know, and displayed for their law enforcement and military. Right. The other big difference you'll see is a lot of dogs here. People bring their hunting dogs yeah. or, or even just their pet dogs. Just so, walking through the show. Walking around. Well, the other thing is it's very European. You walk into booths, somebody says, well, would you like a glass of wine? You're going, wait, it's 10 o'clock in the morning. You go, yeah, well, would you like a glass of wine? <laughs> right, right. A little different than the uh, than the environment at the SHOT Show or the uh, NRA annual meetings. All right, I've got to talk about what you guys have been up to. It seems like uh, we don't go two weeks without there being a new product introduction from Ruger over the last three or four months. Holy cow. I mean, have you guys been sitting back with a lot of this stuff? You know, kind of as, you know, there was a time when you could sell everything. And then we had this past year when sales were slow. My sense is that some of this stuff was kind of in the works for a while and didn't need to come out. Well, some of it was frankly in the works and, and late to market. We were, uh, you know, I'd love to say we had all those uh, products in December roll out, you know, uh, strategic planning, but uh, one or two were planned for December, but right. frankly, a couple of them were late. You know, so we had some great new product launches in December, uh, you know, like the uh, Security 9 pistol, right. the EC9S pistol, both of those out of our plant in Prescott, Arizona, and then the... Uh, of course, the pistol caliber carbine. The, the, the PC-9 is unbelievable. Big, big, big news unbelievable. there. Unbelievable. Yep. T- a takedown. I, I, people say, what is it? I said, well, imagine a 1022 in 9 millimeter that will take Ruger or Glock mags. And, you know, that's what you got. It's amazing. Yeah, that was, that's a lot of fun with the, the magwell, you know, is interchangeable. Like you said, you've got, we've got magwells that come with the gun, the Glock and the uh, Ruger. And then also as an accessory is the American pistol uh, magazine available uh-huh. you know, for sale. You know, over our, through our shop, Ruger. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but it, that gun was very, very strong. We've had tremendous rea- reaction to that one. Of course, people say, what other calibers are coming? And obviously, there's some other calibers coming. There's sure. probably some other magwells in the works as well, because we've had a lot of requests for compatibility with uh, you know, either other manufacturers' magazines or older Ruger magazines, like the P-Series pistols. Oh, okay. People got a lot of those sitting on the shelves. Exactly. Say, hey, I'd like to use these mags. So we're okay. looking at those, trying to trying to make the, uh, you know, because each one of those magwells is a fairly expensive investment to try to make sure we're making a, a wise a wise decision for what should be the next either magwells or calibers. Yeah, you don't want to do all that engineering and then sell 20 of them, you know. Exactly. That's, that's not going to work for you. Exactly. <laughs> Shareholders don't like that. Exactly. The, <laughs> the other fun gun we had that actually gets a lot of traction over here is the uh, Precision Rimfire that we make in our factory down in uh, Mayada, North Carolina. Ah. And that's that's been a lot of fun. I mean, it looks cool. It's a great you know, one of, the, one of the things when you're training, uh, you know, young people, of course, bolt-action rifle is always my preferred, you know, sp- right. bolt-action rim fire to train young people in the right. shooting sports. And, uh, you know, when you have something that combines the uh, functionality of a bolt-action gun with good accuracy and, and it looks cool, 
that's a that's a easier ticket to get that 11 or 12 year old interested in uh, you know learning how well, to shoot properly. I'm, I'm thinking there may be people who are, are shooting the Ruger Precision rifle in centerfire who want to get the rimfire for inexpensive practice, maybe even indoor practice. A- absolutely, that's a good point. In fact, one of the things we have on uh, the Precision rimfire is a you know a user modifiable uh, bolt throw, so you can uh, change to a full centerfire length stroke on, oh, on your bolt. Okay, if you want to indeed practice. You know that longer bolt throw that you have sure. on the uh, on a precision, either in 308 or 65 or six millimeter, whatever you have. All right, got to touch before we get out of here. Got to touch on the shooting team. That was a big announcement. You know, the Ruger professional shooting team. Yeah, that that was a lot of fun. And you know, we have uh, we're we're doing the shooting team for a couple of reasons. One is we've got some great product and new platforms that we think will play very well in those disciplines. Two, we're able to hook up with some, some great folks. Uh, Paul Pluff joined us uh, recently. Paul and I had worked together for many years at Smith & Wesson. Right. Uh, Paul had done a great job with their shooting team. So when we hired Paul, one of the things we wanted Paul to get going on a Ruger shooting team. And he's done a great job uh, with us for you know on that project. Yeah, Doug Koenig heading up the, the team. Exactly. Doug is such, uh, such a gentleman and such a, uh, a good influence on, on product development, product design. And shoots design. everything. Exactly. Shoots everything. Uh, you know, one of the things we plan to incorporate these folks, particularly uh, Doug, is get them into our product planning process, working with our engineers to incorporate some of those ideas that he sees, you know, at, at the highest level of competition and bring those back into production guns. All right. The obvious thing that people say, well, if you have a shooting team and they're using these highly modified guns, at what point do we start seeing some of that technology being offered through Ruger? Well, good point. I mean, there's, uh, there's some guns already, like if you look at the, the uh, Target Champion and Match Champion models of uh, you know, GP revolvers that we've introduced over the last couple of years, we're certainly looking at the opportunity to maybe take that to the next level. You know, there's some, some great things that, you know, we need to do to, uh, for our shooters to, to use in competition, right. you know, with the Ruger banner. But also, you know, there's some great opportunities, I think, to take those guns from, uh, you know, to the next level with some semi-custom and, uh, and some real, uh, real neat special makeups. That we can I was do. sure hoping you were going to say something like semi-custom or custom. That, yeah, that's, that's, yeah. that's kind of the words ring in my head going, that's going to be very cool. It is. It is. And, you know, there's a, like I said, Ruger has some great platforms that, you know, you look at guys that... Uh, you know, have been making uh, a career out of modifying and, and, and building, you know, tricked Absolutely. out Ruger race guns over the, the years. There are companies that have been made out of tricking out Ruger sure. firearms. Exactly. And so I think there's an opportunity for us to do get a little bit more involved in that part of the business. Sure. Makes sense. So as you look out 2018 and beyond, I mean, and I know you guys do crystal ball looking. Nobody knows for sure. But any thoughts as to kind of where the market's going, where you know, Americans are buying? What are they looking for? Well, you know, some of the things, you know, is when you look at the market today, certainly the market of, of 2017, we had to recover a little bit. The market was still a lot of capacity right. in certain segments. A lot of people maybe, uh, you know, a lot of products out there, a lot of value for the consumer. The good news is for the consumer, there's a lot of good values, a lot of good deals out there. Right. So I think in 2018, we're seeing people have uh, recalibrated a little bit. We've, uh, we've taken production down some, as people would know from our, our uh, Makes sense. public's public accounting statements and whatnot. Right. And so as we kind of rationalize that production, you know, it's more important than ever to make sure we excite people with, with good new products. And that's, for Ruger, is the, uh, the lifeblood of, of our company. And you guys have always been great at that. You know, cranking out something new, you the voice of the customer, you listen to what people want. They say, why don't you do this? You go, well, let's talk about it. And you go inside, you spin it around, and you never know what's going to pop out. Right. And you mentioned, like, the pistol caliber carbine. Great, great new product, new platform, a lot of fun to shoot. And, get, and again, with a price of 9 millimeter ammo, it's right. a great opportunity for people to get out to the range and have some fun and easy to shoot. So uh, those are the type of things that we know our customers want to see. Absolutely. So, I mean, we can see a lot more new things from Ruger, I'm guessing. You will. We're going to continue to work on new product introductions. Uh, we'll, we'll get them out when they're ready. We want to make sure we're ready to ship and have product available. Sometimes, right now, for example, pistol caliber carbine, people are trying to find them. They're out there. We're shipping them every day. We've been building and shipping every day since December. Right. It's just that demand has really outstripped supply. Sure. For the time yeah. being. Be patient. Get your order in. And, and don't just wait around. Get an order in with your dealer. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, support your independent dealer. You know, visit him. Get the order in. Make sure he's actually putting the order in with his distributor. Exactly. Because Ruger's one of the companies that sells through dist- a network of distributors, right. not direct to retail. Chris Galloy, thank you so much. Thanks for hosting us here. Thank you, Tom. All right. We'll be right back with more Gun Talk. 
Brownells is gone retro. Check out Brownells' new line of retro AR-15 and AR-style 308 rifles at brownells.com slash retro. Whether you're looking for Eugene Stoner's original 308 design, the famous M16A1, Air Force 601, or the XM-177 carbine, Brownells has the classic, new production, old-school rifle of your dreams. Own the firearm you used in basic training, carried in service, or that Grandpa always talks about. See more at brownells.com slash retro. For more than 70 years, Timney Triggers has been enhancing the shooter's experience. Whether it's a local competition, a day at the range, or even the hunt of a lifetime, setting the standard in aftermarket triggers, Timney is now producing more than 170 models of triggers for bolt-action rifles, shotguns, AR rifles, and semi-automatic rifles. Proudly made in the USA since 1946. Find your new trigger at TimneyTriggers.com. Perhaps more than any other landscape, wetlands embody the life-giving abundance that nature has to offer. And perhaps more than any other organization, Ducks Unlimited is working to ensure that our continent's wetlands not only survive, but thrive for generations well beyond this one. The time is now to band together. The time is now to rescue our wetlands. It's really pretty simple. Your carry gun is a life-saving device. It must be with you. That's what the Springfield Armory XDS is all about. Small enough to carry, big enough to shoot comfortably, shockingly slim, single stack, with a 3.3-inch or 4-inch barrel, available in 9, 40, or 45. Highly accurate, great trigger, fiber optic front sight for fast aimed fire. The XDS at Springfield-Armory.com. That's Springfield-Armory.com. All right, welcome back to Gun Talk. We're at the EWA show. I don't even know what IWA stands for. We're Chris Calloy from Ruger's with us. What does EWA stand for? Do you have any uh, idea? It's a German name, and it escapes me right, yeah, I don't right know. now, Tom. We'll, we look, we we'll look it up. We just call it EWA. That's right. That's a, now, how long have you been coming here? Uh, I think the first time I came to the EWA show was uh, maybe mid-'90s yeah. when, when I worked for Smith & Wesson. I started, started with the co- that company in uh, 1989. And so that's when I started going to the first SHOT Show. It was 1990 when we rolled out the, uh, the 40 S&W with uh, Winchester. Oh, wow. Yeah, so a long yeah. time ago. Yeah, I guess so. Holy cow. So, you know, as you walk around here, I'm sitting there watching one of the booths over there, and they're shooting full auto and stuff. And as you said, probably a lot of that is designed for law enforcement military here. It is, and a lot of it is also a big draw for some of these booths because ah. you know, civilian ownership is so restricted in so many European countries right. that you know it's still a big draw for you know even though you've got you know, the, the primary market might be a hunting audience or a target shooting audience, they still like to see you know sometimes what what they can't have, and it Ever, reminds it, you just how fortunate we are to be in, oh, you know, yeah. in the United States with our Second Amendment. I was looking at that, and I was remembering way, way back with Ruger, and I was just thinking about this, and I don't have any idea if you guys even still make it. Way back, there was a, a full-auto Mini 14 made. It was the uh, AC556. Okay. And, uh, you know, we, d- we no longer make them. We have, have a few that we've made, you know, uh, a handful that were pre-1986, and then, a, you know, a few more that were made post-86, but right. it's been a long time since we made the... Uh, made that particular model. There are still some in use. In fact, right. the, uh, some of the French police still use that. And, uh, really? There are still some uh, Department of Corrections that still have the, both the Mini and the, uh, the full auto version. So in theoretically, inventory. one that was made before 86 could end up working its way into civilian hands. It could, and, and some of those command a real premium out there on the, uh, you know, for the, the legal Class 3 guys. I mean, that's a real premium, premium item. Well, you know, of course, Rugers have been collected through the years. I mean, there's a super avid Ruger Collector Association. It's actually a couple of them. Really? And, and uh, you know, there's some great, great folks. They're very knowledgeable about the product. Uh, okay, they help us sometimes when we've got questions on, of a historical nature. Because they know uh, everything. They, they, <laughs> they know everything. They know everything, all the history. They're, they are the historians. They, they are. And, uh, you know, some of the things that we, collect, that we all collect or accumulate over the years, one of the things that I... I kind of uh, accumulate is the uh, the drills that uh, Mr. Ruger made before he founded the company in 1949. Really? He made hand hand drills, and they're somewhat unique. If, if you look at them, you can see them online. They actually look like the the original standard pistol, 
And so he was making those drills with the standard pistol frames before he launched the company. Wow. And they're marked. Uh, this was before he teamed up with Alexander Sturm in 1949. They're marked uh, the Ruger Corp, Southport, uh, Connecticut. Wow, that would be uh, – how do you even find those? They're, they're around. Sometimes you see them at yard sales. Sometimes you'll see them at uh, – you know, you'll find them on eBay. You go, yeah, and, I'll give you two bucks for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they are kind of fun. It's a neat part of our history, part of uh, Mr. Ruger's history before yeah. founding the company with Alexander Stern. I mean, he, I mean for those who don't know, uh, Bill Ruger was truly a genius. He was a designer of a lot of things besides firearms, even f- automobiles. Right, you know, right. The Ruger automobile, which is no, you know – Pretty cool class. He was quite the collector, obviously. Quite, quite the collector. But again, like you said, really a uh, a, a real uh, genius and innovator. Yeah. You know, uh, kind of a Renaissance man. He wasn't really he? was. Yep. All right. So, t- speaking of Renaissance man, makes you kind of spin back to I was thinking about Jeff Cooper, which made me think about ten millimeter because he was very involved, you know, with the Bren ten and all of that. And then now you guys have ten millimeters out, both in revolver and semi-auto version, nineteen eleven. It is, and you know, the ten millimeters obviously been around for a while, but it really making a pretty strong resurgence. I mean, we're seeing some, a lot of demand for it. Um, you know, frankly, it's. You know, our informal survey of the, uh, the, the feedback we get from consumers on our new pistol caliber carbine, I think we've probably got more requests for a 10 millimeter than even a 45 or, or a 40. No kidding. As far as what, what caliber would you like to see next in it? Right. So the 10 is, the, the 10 is strong, and obviously we've got the, our 1911 and a 10 millimeter now. Right. Uh, like you said, we've got a revol- couple of revolver models in a 10 millimeter, and it really is, it, it's a neat cartridge. And uh, you know, seems to be making a making a, a new run. Well, and it, and it's a good cartridge. It comes, as you know, only too well, in different loadings. Some of them are barely forty caliber, like forty S and W caliber. But when you load it up, it becomes a whole different beast. Right, it does. And it's cause we used to back in the day was the, referred to as a full house normal load. You know, because <laughs> yes, exactly norm ammunition right. yes. had uh, at the time the most powerful load. Well, when you design a gun, you have to design for potentially that kind of load being shot in it. You do, and uh, you know, you, you also you got to go back and look at what what's been made, what's out there, so you're backward compatible with ammo that may be out there from before, mm-hmm. and uh, you know. Otherwise, you're, you're, you end up putting a, a product out and having a, war, a warning on it, you know, what it's capable of or not capable yeah, of. Yeah, you'd rather not do that. Exactly. You'd rather make sure you do your engineering work up front and make sure it's capable of handling anything out there. All right. So, obviously, we were talking in the break. As soon as you bring out the, the PC-9, the pistol caliber a semi-auto, people say, could you put a 10 in that? Because, <laughs> man, a 10 with a long barrel, that would be something else. Yeah, I mean, we get... It, like any new any new uh, product you launch, I mean, the first thing people do is tell you that, you know, if you'd only make it this way, then me and my brother-in-law would both buy one. Yeah, that's two. <laughs> and, and in some cases, it's only two. <laughs> but but a lot of times, that's our best feedback. The informal channel we get, you know, typically from our, uh, we have a page on our website called Email the CEO, and a lot of that is people saying what they'd like to see next from Ruger. And uh, again, that's where we got a lot of feedback on that 10 millimeter. Okay, I'm going to give you my feedback right now, all right? So uh, I love the 10, but how about a 41 mag? Well, 40, 41 mag in the, uh, you know, doing it in the pistol caliber carbine. I and, mean, again, that's our you Oh, know, yeah. Our I, was thinking, I was thinking revolver. Oh, yeah. and a revolver. Yeah, we've got a lot of requests for 41 mags yeah. as well. I was thinking about, yeah. 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 The 41 mag and a revolver is just, yeah, it's another one of those little niche deals, but there's enough of us out it, there that are crazy. It's kind of like 257 Roberts. You're going, you're not going to sell a ton of them, but now right. and then you could bring it out maybe at a limited run. Yep. And and we've got some good distributors uh, that work with us, the Taylor Group. Right. People like Lipsy's and Davidson's that do special makeups. I talked to so, Jason. <laughs> yeah, and, and exactly. And then, you know, they may put one together. We'll, we're, we're glad to work with it. It might be a, a short run of a 500 pieces or 1,000 right. pieces. Which brings up the whole idea of these limited runs. People need to be aware that those are being done because a lot of times they're not really announced. You kind of have to – you go to uh, a gallery of guns, a Talo, uh, a Ellipses, and, and they're going to do this short run. you got to know about it ahead of time. Yeah, we try to keep people up with up to date with it on our website. We have a section for distributor exclusives. That's true. And we also have the uh, – if you sign up for the Ruger newsletter, you know, online, ah. we'll, we'll give you those announcements okay. of what's out there, what's coming, so which that's how you stay plugged it. in. Exactly. And some of those are – some of those things you just look at and you're curious about, then other ones you say, wow, that's the one gun I've been waiting for. Yeah, you know, when you say, oh, a Ruger number one in this caliber, yes. And I know there's not going to be a lot of them made. You better move fast. Right. That's the other thing. Exactly. Don't, don't dally. Exactly. Because they, they do go quick, and a lot of times, you know, a distributor, of course, wants to get into it, sell his product, move on to the next one. Right. So, All right, let's talk about, I mean, we're in Europe here. We're in Nuremberg, Germany. The international market for Ruger, a lot of people, it's a great American company, but they don't know that you guys sell guns all over the world. 
We do. It's as you would expect. It's highly regulated. Uh, you know, we have uh, over forty international distributors. We sell just like we do in the U.S. through a network of distributors. It's not a major part of our business. In fact, typically, you know, the uh, it's around five or six percent of our business that we that we do an export business. Okay. But it's it's still important. We have a lot of great trading partners over here, and what we do with this show is we've got the display out front, and then in the back we have a meeting room where we meet with all of our. Uh, distributors who come to the show. We schedule meetings every hour on the hour for mm-hmm. the four days we're here, and we meet with them and review business from the past year, review what's, what business we have going forward. And some of the same things we talk about with our U.S. distributors, what might have special makeups, might, some of them have unique ammunition requirements, things that we, uh, you know, Italy, for example, uh, I think it's a 45 HP. They don't have a 45 ACP. It's a 45 HP, slightly oh. different length cartridge. I mean, there's lots of nuances like that. There's, so there uh, are products Ruger makes only for, like, the European market that we wouldn't see in the U.S. Yes, and some things like Canada has certain barrel uh, laws, you know, mm-hmm. as it relates to, I think it's 4.2 inch on handguns. So you'll see a slightly longer barrel. You'll see... Uh, some oddities that maybe we, we try to work around to make sure we can support folks in, in these countries. Right. Okay. Makes sense. Uh, doing business in Europe, you have distributors here because, obviously, you can't handle, uh, for one thing, if nothing else, it's just a language issue. Well, and it, that's right. Language and, and, uh, and, the and culture, regulations. You know, typically our distributors uh, on the international side uh, handle not only the, the buying and selling and warehousing function, but they also work on the promotional side. We ask them to, they're the ones that do advertising within their, ho- within their home market, within their host country. Mm-hmm. Uh, they also uh, provide warranty station support for Ruger products. So, if ah. you're, so we, for example, in Germany, we have two distributors, the uh, Albert Kint and uh, Heinrich Henke. Both of them do warranty work for us if someone has a problem with a Ruger gun that they bought you know, in, in Germany or just they live in Germany. What do you see in terms of interest in Germany or in Europe that you could say, well, that's definitely different from the U.S. market? Well, I mean, because of the laws restricting personal ownership, I mean, what you find, what I've found over the years is that it's such a considered purchase, you know, and there's a lot of barriers to entry. Hmm. It's a lot harder to become a gun owner in a company like Germany. And so there's a lot more training required. There's specific security requirements for the guns. Right. And uh, so you, what you get is people who are very, very passionate about the sport. Exactly. And they, they really commit to training. They commit to, to yeah, and they, owning and, the and, and they buy the higher-end stuff. They, they, they'll spend more money. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. I got to run here, Chris. Look, thank you again so much. Uh, I may pull you back in a little bit later in the show, okay? All right, Tom. You got it. All right. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Gun Talk. Tom Gresham here. We're having a whole bunch of fun. We're uh, in the Ruger booth here at the IWA show in Nuremberg, Germany. Uh, it is fascinating. It's a big show. It's much bigger than you would think. Well, it's much bigger than I ever thought. Uh, I was working under the, probably the same kind of misperception that a lot of people have of Europeans not being into guns or not having many guns or not many people like guns. Uh, boy, when you walk around the show here, you realize that's not the case at all. They love the shooting sports. Now, it's different here, no doubt. It's definitely different. But uh, you have a lot of people who love hunting and love competition shooting. I walked by a booth a little while ago that said, you know, the big sign was perfect for Ipsic shooting. You're going, oh, okay, that's interesting. It was ammo. So uh, a lot of things, as I said, a lot of things are the same, a lot of things that are different. So yesterday here, I came over early for the show to go to the World Forum for Shooting Activities meeting, WFSA. Who is that? Well, they're the group from the U.S. that basically works with the United Nations. Because, of course, as you probably know, there's been a lot of uh, work over the years within the United Nations to restrict gun ownership, to regulate guns, to control guns. And it's a continual fight. And we have a group called WFSA, World Forum for Shooting Activities, uh, who does that. It is a bizarre Byzantine world. And as I listen to the descriptions of what they have to do and the process that they go through, uh, there are these uh, NGOs 
non-governmental organizations which work with the UN. And a lot of times the NGOs actually decide what the uh, they're going to be doing there. So what it's interesting, one of the things that happens is when they show up, there are there are basically six groups, NGOs, that work on the side of gun ownership. There are 91 NGOs that work to restrict gun ownership. So it's a 6 to 91 ratio already. It is an uphill battle. But they're fighting and little things. I mean, there's little esoteric things that you think, well, that's nothing. Like a regulation internationally to say this is how deep the engraving needs to be on serial numbers. Well, if it's not the same as the standard that the ATF has, all of a sudden you have to change everything. And if you have people who don't like guns making the regulations like that, they could set it up in such a way that it's impossible to do, and they will try. Sometimes it's because they're devious, but sometimes it's because they just don't know anything. So that that bears watching. And fortunately, we have people who will put up with that. I mean, and I do mean that because as I'm sitting there listening to the discussions of this, my eyes are glazing over and I'm starting to go to sleep. I'm thinking, how do you people do that? How do you go to these uh, meetings and not just crash and burn? I just don't understand. But at least there are people who do that. It's so much about process, and I'm not a process guy, I can tell you that. Uh, but one of the things that happened yesterday was very cool, is uh, I was able to be the the guest speaker, the keynote speaker for the WFSA. They also gave me their, basically their Lifetime Achievement Award. And it's extremely rare for the same person to be selected as the keynote speaker and to also receive the award, so I was very honored by that. But I was able to kind of explain in my talk to them a bit about the history of the last 50 years of gun ownership and gun regulation in the United States and kind of connect some of the dots of what happened. Things like, and things that people wouldn't recognize or wouldn't maybe put together, like uh, the Charles Manson murders, Sharon Tate. Uh, when that happened in 69, and then the book came out in 74, Helter Skelter, scared the devil out of people. A lot of people decided, I'm going to get a gun to protect myself. And then we have Hurricane Katrina, where people saw what was going on there and said, wow, uh, we really are vulnerable. And then you had, people might not think about it in terms of gun ownership, but it's a thing. Uh, in 1980, Ted Turner creates CNN. And all of a sudden, you don't just get local news, you get national news all the time. And a s- local story in Pittsburgh feels like a local story in Phoenix, Because they talk about it all the time. And all of a sudden, people are thinking, wow, there's just crime everywhere. There's problems everywhere. And maybe it's a uh, misperception or maybe it's more of a realization of what's really going on. But I really do feel that the 24-hour, seven days a week news cycle has contributed to people deciding to protect themselves. Then, of course, you have the, you know, talk about the trends and the themes. You have Florida with their concealed carry coming in, and then uh, state after state after state getting concealed carry. Now 20 million people licensed to carry guns, and half the people get buying a first-time handgun are women, and half the people getting their carry permits now are women. Huge changes. So I'm trying to explain to an international market why America is what it is in terms of firearms. And it's, I wrapped it up, and I said, to fully understand what's going on in America and why we feel the way we do and why we have our Second Amendment, and why we cherish it so much and why we protect it so much is to understand that to us, firearms ownership is the right, the ability to protect ourselves and our family. Firearms ownership is the right to stay alive. Firearms ownership is our responsibility, and we guard it because of that. And until someone understands that basic issue, they really can't understand firearms ownership in the United States. And I think with what's going on right now in the media... They don't get that at all. They see us as, they well, you have your little clubs and you go out and you shoot and you're, you're, you know, this and that, and it's insignificant. They don't understand that to many of us, the ability to have a gun to protect ourselves and our family is one of the most important things we have. More important to us than our government, for instance. And those of us who have looked at it hard, and many millions of people now have, look at it and go, yeah, you know what, the government's not going to be there. In fact... The courts have ruled the government doesn't have to be there. The police don't have to protect you. They're not required by law. Some weird way they're required to protect society in general, but not an individual. You can't hold them responsible if they don't. They'll do what they can, but you can't believe that they're going to be there. That would be childish.
So when I got through, I got a lot of attaboys, a lot of people saying thank you. And I kept saying, you can't give up an inch. When you give up anything, you never get it back. You never get it back. You can't play defense. In defense, a good game is you only lose so much ground. When you play an offense, you're gaining ground. You're pushing back, and that's where we have to be all the time. We can't be playing defense. We have to be playing offense. We have to be trying to get back our rights every time we can. Hey, got to wrap it up here. We'll be back in just a minute with more from the Ewa Show in Nuremberg, Germany. For tactical equipment for military, law enforcement, and shooting enthusiasts, look for the name Elite Survival Systems, creators of high-quality, intelligently designed products for concealed carry, discreet transport, and rigorous tactical uses. Elite Survival Systems knows there isn't just one method of carry that works for everyone. Elite offers a vast array of concealment products to fit your lifestyle, including holsters, belts, vests, pouches, slings, bags, backpacks, and cases. Find out more at EliteSurvival.com. If you carry a gun, you need training. Your concealed carry class was definitely not training. But time, money, and obligations keep you from spending days at a shooting school. The trusted folks at Gun Talk can help. Concealed Carry One, our DVD featuring the VADA group, covers what gun, what holster, how to carry, where to wear your gun, and much more. Visit ShopGunTalk.com. That's ShopGunTalk.com. Look. This really is life and death. Learn how to stay aware, how to get away, and how to fight if you must. At ShopGunTalk.com, you can get the two DVD set, including Fighting with the 1911 with Tiger McKee. No matter what gun you carry, this vital training info can save your life. Learn the draw, the stance, reloading, vital gear from Gun Talk. That's ShopGunTalk.com. ShopGunTalk.com. This is Jeff with Black Hills Ammunition. Our Honey Badger line was designed in cooperation with Lehigh Defense. It's a product of my 37 years in law enforcement and 35 years in ammunition manufacturing. This bullet is the future for self-defense. It's what's in my weapon right now. I think that is the ultimate testimonial, when a guy is willing to stake his life on it. For more information, visit the Black Hills Ammunition Facebook page. Your everyday carry advantage. The new M&P Shield M2.0 pistol from Smith & Wesson has the enhancements of the M2.0 line with aggressive grip texture and a crisp and lighter trigger pull. Extremely thin and lightweight, you can carry it all day. Also available with an integrated crimson trace laser in 9 or 40. The M&P Shield M2.0. Visit smith-wesson.com. All right, welcome back to Gun Talk. Tom Gresham here. No, you can't call in because we're doing this show recorded. We're at the Iwa show in Nuremberg, Germany, having a ball over here. Can't do it live because the time zones are all messed up. So we're doing that. We're joined right now by Jeff Davis from Barrett, of course, the uh, the famous Barrett 50 caliber rifle, which people know, company out of Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Welcome, Jeff. Well, good to meet with you, Tom. Absolutely. So uh, people know Barrett. Because of the 50 caliber. I mean, it's synonymous with that. And that's what Ronnie created. I mean, how old was he? He was like, he was, he was, uh, like, he was pretty late, young when yeah, he started late, that. Late 20s. Yeah. Um, he, he started it. Uh, originally, the company was founded in 1982 in Murfreesboro, okay. Tennessee, okay. Uh, where he was born and raised. And uh, kind of got the idea. He was a photographer is how he originally started. Um, really? His, his dad had a cabinet shop, but Ronnie uh, went into the photography business. And there was a company in town that requested... Uh, they needed a photographer to do a photo shoot of a gunboat uh, with two 50 caliber machine guns at, okay. in, uh, at a lake in, in Nashville. And that's kind of what started Ronnie's, uh, Ronnie's thought process of can you, can you make a shoulder-fired 50 caliber? Well, and I'm sure at the time people said, oh, it'll just tear your shoulder off. You can't possibly do that. He, he made the comment uh, one time to me that you know, he was dumb enough to know it couldn't be done. <laughs> um, and, and, uh, and since then, he's, he's really grown a neat business. Uh, with lots of different products. Yeah, but you got obviously you got the it's a semi-auto rifle firing the 50 BMG. And for those who uh, there may be people who don't know, a 50 caliber Browning machine gun round is huge compared to say a 30 out six or something. It looks like a Coke bottle. It's exactly five times larger than the 30 out six. John Browning designed it. Okay. Yeah, so it's five times larger than a 30 out six. Okay, and you're shooting a roughly 750 caliber bullet going what? 
2,700? Yeah, 2,650 feet per second. Right. And uh, when you shoot one, when you're the shooter, you know know, something happened. But also, if you're like to the side of somebody, say you're 100 yards away and they're shooting at some length, I tell people, I describe it, it's like hearing somebody rip a sheet where it goes, you hear the bullet going across like that. I mean, you are sending a big chunk of uh, lead, copper, steel, whatever, uh, and you're looking at 12,000 foot-pounds? Correct. It, at the muzzle, it's just in between twelve and 13,000 foot-pounds of energy. Right. I mean, it, it's serious. Originally, the idea was this is something we could use to shoot a long way, right? Correct. So, and that's what it's still used for, for, for the most part. So what, so what do people do with a 50 cal now? What I mean, I know there's competitions and such. So, so we, uh, you know, there's the the uh, 50 cal shooters association um, has a uh, championship out in Raton, New Mexico, every year in July. At the Wheaton um, Center, there. It, yeah. Correct, and and we sponsor that event, and then the following that is King of the Two Mile, um, and so we sponsored, oh. and then our we have a couple of our. Uh, our guys that compete in that, mm-hmm. um, and one of our guys took second in the King of the Two Mile uh, last year. So. Shooting two miles? Shooting two miles. Holy moly. Um, and uh, we use the 416 Barrett cartridge okay. is, is what we compete in that with. Um, but, you know, people will uh, will also use, you know, a variety of different calibers. Sure. But, but we choose to use the 416. Which, which I'm glad you brought up the 416 because, you know, people know the Barrett as being the 50, but the Barrett company is so much more than that now. That is correct. We have lots of different products. Uh, uh, one of our our, uh, our latest products is is a lightweight hunting rifle called the Fieldcraft. Really? Uh, we offer it in a variety of different calibers. Uh, we have it in a long action and a short action, and we're exploring micro actions um, as well. Haven't jumped into the magnum actions yet, but mm-hmm. it's uh, it's something that'll be down the road. Um, but we do offer it in the two seventies, the the thirty out six, twenty five out six, and the t- uh, the six five by fifty five Swede. Huh. Um, and then the short action, 65, 308, 22, 250 are, are some of the calibers wow. that, we, that we offer in that as well. Why? I mean, this is a crowded field uh, A bolt action hunting rifles. I mean, there's already a dozen or dozens of companies doing that. Why did Barrett decide to do that? Uh, in, in our in our magazine, we, we, we made a comment that we couldn't find the perfect hunting rifle, so we made one. <laughs> Um, now, now that's not to say that there's not there's lots of great products out there, but uh, you know our rifle is a stainless steel barrel in action. Uh, right. It's it's fully bedded in a hand laid carbon fiber stock. Uh, we have a relationship with Timney Triggers, and, and we have a Timney Trigger in there. Um, but it's it's uh, it's proven to be a very nice lightweight hunting rifle. You know that answer is the perfect answer for somebody who is a tinkerer. You can say, you know, those are the rifles are really good, but I just can't find what I, I want. And most people would say, well, you know, it's just unfortunate. I can't find what I want. But when you're the kind of tinkerer that Ronnie and the crew at Barrett are, you go, well, well we'll just build it. That, we'll, we'll, you know, I know what we want. We could just make it. That's exactly right. <laughs> exactly right. Some of the other products that we have um, are the, the MRAD rifle system. Um, and it actually, we, we make it in nine different calibers, but it's a caliber convertible rifle right. um, that you can literally swap a barrel uh, and, and a bolt face, and your magazine may change depending on the caliber um, in under, in under 10 one, minutes. And that, you, just, you just gave me one of those. I did. I gave yeah. you a, a lapel pin. Well, uh, it's M-Rad. okay. You're, I don't want to tell people. That, but yeah, okay. So you gave me an MRAD lapel pin, but uh, pretty cool. Um, but so it's been it's been a good uh, product offering for us. So we have uh, we have it in several countries as the primary sniper rifle uh, for for that particular for that particular military. Right. Um, but it uh, it is a fantastic uh, shooting rifle from uh, the the ability to change calibers. It has a folding stock. It has a twenty or thirty MOA a tapered rail. Wow! Um, so you can get more, you get more, out more of range optic. out of it. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Um, the the uh, trigger um, is fully adjustable. It can be either a two stage or a single stage. Uh, you can have a flat shoe or a, a curved trigger shoe. Um, but it is a. So it's, you know what? I'm hearing all this. I'm thinking this is a rifle designed by shooters. It, it absolutely that's, is. That's the deal because that's that's the kind of detail that only. People who really do shoot, shoot long range, shoot competition, would pay attention. Jeff, can I get you? Hold on a second. I'm going to take you to the break. Let's talk about this when we come back and some of the other things that Barrett's been up to, okay? Sounds great, Tom. All right, don't go far. All right, we're in the uh, <laughs> the huge hall here. We're in Hall 7A at the Ewa Show in Nuremberg, Germany. I'm Tom Gresham. 
This is Gun Talk. Be right back. Tom Gresham returns with more Gun Talk from the IWA Outdoor Classic Show in Germany right now. All right, we're back with you, Tom Gresham, here at the uh, Ewa Show in Nuremberg, having a bunch of fun. We're in the uh, Ruger booth, talking with uh, Jeff from Barrett. Jeff, uh, now you do international sales, right? That's correct. So describe to me that, because a lot of people think, oh, you know, people in other countries, they don't have guns. I'm walking around here going, really? <laughs> Surprise <laughs> for me, right? Absolutely. It, 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 the, the, this is a huge event, obviously. It's one of our favorite shows that we come to. Uh, you just get to see all the different products and right. know that the European market is very much interested in hunting and and uh, the different uh, the different things that go on with with firearms. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, as you walk around here, one of the things that surprised me was how much was here, like ARs, like that type of gun. Now, some of those are probably not being sold to civilians. It's more of a law enforcement military. Is that Correct. a lot of what you guys are doing? We do. We do. We we have actually products in 73 State Department approved countries around the world. Oh wow. Um are offer Barrett products um and we have uh relationships with lots of different countries. Um uh, but everything is approved by State Department. Huh. People I keep hearing that there there are no regulations on guns in the United States. <laughs> that, that is far from true, as you know. <laughs> yeah, man, you're dealing with agencies left, right, and center, aren't you, all the it, time? It's a very heavily regulated industry. Uh, and I tell people, I say, well, like just in the U.S., I say, name me another consumer product where in order to buy it, you have to get the approval of the FBI. And they go, what? Say, hey, when a gun maker makes a gun, when it ends up at the consumer level, the FBI has to approve that purchase. Right? That is correct. You know, and people go, really? I mean, obviously we know that, but people are outside. They're thinking, and they've been told by the media, well, it's, it's not regulated. that Anybody can buy a gun. Well, not really. No, it, it, it's, it's unfortunate some of the misinformation that's out there regarding our industry. Yeah, it is. And it's, um, you know, it's up to us to keep challenging it. You can't let that stuff sit there because if it sits there and we don't challenge it, it becomes the truth. That nonsense becomes the truth. Agreed. You know? All right, so Barrett, let's. Talk about. I want to talk about your light rifle again, okay. just because that's so cool. Uh, so, are these lightweight rifles? They are. The short action is right at five pounds, five point one pounds. Really? Uh, that and is then, light. then the long action is a, is about five and a half pounds. Man. And uh, my, I'm just looking at it now. It's good looking too. There, there was a couple of us that are, have already had the opportunity to go out and hunt with these rifles, right. and and. It was a fantastic gun to carry. It has a blind magazine, so it carries nice in your hand. Okay. Um, and uh, the just the weight of it, and, and you take a nice weight, lightweight optic, right? Um, and it just doesn't even feel, you know, like you're you're and, and, lugging something bigger. Of course, you're working with Timney trigger, so I know it's got a good trigger in it. It is it's, very got a very good trigger. I always say the uh, the action may be, you know, the uh, the heart of a rifle, but the trigger's the soul. You know, Agreed. That's the part that you interface with. Agreed. And, I mean, and, and we focus on having a, a, a good trigger in all of our rifles. Right. Uh, we we, uh, we use Geisley triggers in our AR-style rifles. Um, the trigger that we have for our MRAD is made in-house, and it's fully adjustable for sear engagement, weight, over travel. Um, it, it's easy to become a trigger snob, isn't it? it you, whenever you, you get, have a nice trigger, it, you, you definitely— uh, You get ruined. You do. You know, and then you go shoot a, a gun that doesn't have a good trigger, you're going— Will this thing ever go off? <laughs> You're right. I mean, we do, we do have a little heavier trigger in our, in our 50 BMG well, rifles yeah. from a safety standpoint. Sure. Um, but we, we have been known for having very nice triggers in, in our rifles. Very cool. Well, Jeff Davis, thank you so much. Barrett, of course, is a, a real innovative American company. You know, you, you guys are doing a lot of cool stuff. And then the new lightweight rifle, I think, is going to get people's attention. What's the price point on this? Uh, $1,800 $1, okay. is, is what the price point is. If you want one with a threaded barrel, it's going to be 1850 1850 because I noticed that you had uh, some images in your catalog here with a suppressor on it. We, we do have that. That's becoming more of a trend nowadays. You bet. Um, and uh, we definitely feel like it's a, a, something that we would want to offer. All right. And the uh, web address is uh, Barrett.net. That is correct. There you go. All right. You take care. All right. All right. We'll be right back. In just a minute with more from the Iwa Show in Nuremberg, Germany. 